is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life, and he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did it for science. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting Bible? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 The Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. And he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a word from the Lord. Thank you for staying tuned. Hope you're ready for another study from God's Word. We want to always put our content information up here for you so that you can uh, know how to reach us. If you want to uh, get in touch with us, anybody from the Church of Christ in this area, we'd be glad to study the Bible with you and uh, uh, to come out and, and visit with you, or we'd be glad for you to meet with us any any time you have an opportunity to meet where we meet. 250 the Boulevard is where we're meeting uh, in Eden. 276-340-2653 uh, is how you can reach me or word from the Lord at gmail.com. And I want to put uh, the content information up for uh, uh, the brethren in uh, uh, Martinsville or in Danville as well, Marks and Danville, 120 American Legion. And uh, uh, they meet on uh, Tuesday nights. If you, are, if you are in the area, I encourage you to go out on Tuesday nights and uh, study the Bible with the brethren over on uh, 120 American Legion. If you're in the Martinsville area on, on Wednesday nights, uh, H23 Starting Avenue. Brother Johnny Robertson is uh, is there. Micah's there. There's their information. And uh, uh, I'm actually teaching class on Wednesday night in Martinsville at this point in time. So uh, if you're in the area, Eden area, on Thursday nights, Brother Johnny is teaching uh, the Book of Romans and uh, on uh, uh, up on the boulevard. So we're kind of doing a little swap out just to uh, uh, give ourselves a chance to uh, uh, teach and a uh, little breather go through some lessons that we've uh, we've taught the class. I've taught Galatians in uh, Martinsville, I mean in, in uh, Eden, and now I'm teaching in Martinsville, and Johnny's doing the same with the book of Romans, and we're uh, constantly trying to uh, uh, help uh, each other out in that capacity. If for some reason my, my computer just went out. So I don't know if... Uh, Here we go. So anyway, they are. no, is it? That didn't help. I'm sure. Take a quick break. I can't see. Uh, yeah, everything everything went black on on my here. Let's uh, we'll go to a commercial break, Matt, if we could, and we'll get everything lined back up. Stay tuned. In the Church of Christ, we teach that 
the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle, we'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here, and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Don't flex your muscles, flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord, Thursday nights at 9. I did it for science. What power? What power? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. And he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did it for science. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. And hi, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Star News on WGSR 47.1 in Reedsville, North Carolina. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we, therefore we will intermingle. We will also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here, and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. All right, and we're back. All right, now, we're just going to get on into our lesson before anything else happens, and that'll be the, the safe way about it. Friends, one of the things that um, I want you to, to be thinking about is the fact that we are constantly dealing with questions that uh, uh, we have been dealing with for a number of years. And sometimes people call in and they'll ask the same question, or we're dealing with the same subject matter, 
And so we kind of have to deal with them again and again and again. And, and sometimes those who have been watching a long time, they say, well, you've already been over that subject. Well, there's always people new who are watching it all the time. And so we have to, you have to realize that, you know, we're, we're gaining audiences. People are watching online now. And so there's a lot of times people have the same questions that you may have known the answer to. You may have heard the Bible answer to it, but they don't. And so we have to deal with this on a, on a, uh, um, on a regular basis. So what we're going to do tonight is really just a simple lesson that has to do with interpretation. How do you understand what the Bible is meaning? Now, we hear a lot of times people say, well, you know, James, uh, everybody has their own, own interpretation. Well, that's really not, not the case. When you talk about the Bible and you're talking about the fact that it was written from the mind of God, you have to realize that God wrote the Bible so that we could understand it. And so he put it in words because words have meanings. And without the, uh, the interpretation of the, sp of the speaker or the writer's words, then the hearer is not edified. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, Paul said, So likewise, and I need, probably need to put that up on, the, on our uh, uh, program here. He says, So likewise, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to under be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, uh, many kinds of, many, many kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, now listen, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh as a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So we have, this, we have this great need then to understand what is being uh, written and what is being spoken so that we can be edified, so that we can understand, okay? Now, when we're talking about the Bible, you need to realize that God wrote the Bible so that man can understand it. Every, every scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto, unto every good work. Now, if that's the case, then God intended for us to understand these words. And as such, he wrote it in such a way that we could understand it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. I mean the Bible speaks in ways, or it's written in ways that we can understand it. It's written in ways that, that we would talk. Now I'm getting a, a glitch on my... My video, this is just not my, this is not my night, but that's okay. We're going to try this, and then we're going to come right back, see if we can do this again. So the Bible uses figures of speech. It uses parts of speech like, like we would. And one of those things is like, uh, is, for example, uh, Figures of speech, you know, more figures of speech than you need to shake a stick at. Well, the Bible uses figures of speech as well. And one of those figures of speech is a simile. Now, friends, if you don't understand that God is writing the Bible in a way that you and I can understand, then you're going to miss a very simple yet basic and fundamental aspect of understanding the Bible. God is going to sp is speaking to us, and so he's going to talk to us as we would talk to one another, and we use figures of speech. So notice this. When you talk about a simile, now, what's a simile? A simile is a word or phrase by which anything is likened unto one of its aspects to another. And you use words such as like, as, likened, likened unto, so, and, and etc. So these are indications of a simile. For example, in Psalm 1, verse 1, you have the, the psalmist is writing, and he says, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. Now notice verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth his fruit in the season. Now he's comparing this righteous man to a tree and he's saying he's like a tree. That's not saying he is a tree. That, that's, a, that's a stronger, that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a stronger figure of speech. It's a simile. It's like a tree. Now, 
if, uh, if we say, well, he treated me like a dog. Well, that's not as strong as if he said, well, he is a dog. See, that, that's a stronger figure of speech. And so, and, and the Bible uses those too. Jesus actually called Herod a fox. You go tell that old fox. You go tell that fox. So, you see, these are figures of speech. God is writing the Bible in ways that we can understand it. Romans 6 verse 4 is another example of this. Romans 6 and verse 4, Paul says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So, so, so uh, we are baptized with him in his death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so we. So like as Christ. We are buried with Christ in a like fashion. All right? Now, why, why is this so important? Why is it so significant? Well, because when we talk about things like uh, the Holy Spirit, and that is a very common topic on these programs, but you'll find that oftentimes people don't understand or don't get the, the significance of a simple figure of speech. For example, for example, I want you to consider... Uh, Acts chapter 2. Let me just go here to Acts chapter 2. And uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse, we're going to start in verse 1. Now, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared on the, unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. Now notice, now notice, they were, they were uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Cloven tongues like as of fire. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this is why it's so important, friends, when we're learning something so simple as figures of speech. Because I want you to notice this. In the Bible, when these people on the day of Pentecost were gathered together, the Bible says that, they were, that there was a sound from heaven like as a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't a rushing mighty wind. There wasn't papers blowing everywhere. Curtains weren't blowing everywhere. You know, uh, 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 clothes scattered and, and about and, and uh, uh, tables overturned like a tornado coming through. There wasn't a great wind. It was, the, it was a sound of a wind. It was a sound of a wind. Now, sometimes you hear people describe, say, a tornado. When people describe a tornado, oftentimes they say, well, it sounded like a freight train. Well, it wasn't a freight train, friend. It just sounded like a freight train. Now, just moments ago, a train's going to come through, and a train will probably come through before the end of the hour, or right after the, the hour. It comes through on a pretty regular basis here. And you can probably hear that train coming through. Well, if I said, well, that sounds like a train, well, it may be something else. But if you say it's like that, then you're comparing it to something. For an example, so there wasn't a real wind. There was just the sound like as a wind. And it, and it said on them, cloven tongues like as a fire. It wasn't really fire, friends. It wasn't really fire. Now, why is this important? It's important because oftentimes when people hear this like as a fire, what they do is they confuse that for the baptism of fire. They confuse that with, with, the, with the baptism of fire that, that John the baptizer mentioned in Matthew 3, verse 11. Now, listen to what John says. In Matthew 3... Matthew 3, verse 11, and I, I don't think that uh, we're going to be able to see these uh, properly on the screen, so I'm going to type these up here. Matthew 3, 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, when people read that, they go, oh, well, I remember over in Acts chapter 2, they were baptized with fire, and they were speaking in tongues. So you have this baptism of fire, and you have the Pentecostal group all praying for the baptism of fire. Let's pray for the baptism of fire. Friends, if you don't understand what the Bible is talking about, you do not want to pray for the baptism of fire. 
See, you're, you're saying, well, I want the baptism of fire when you don't understand what it is because you don't understand how the Bible talks. Notice, Jesus promised a baptism of the Spirit. Let's notice. Acts 1, verse 5. Acts 1, verse 5. <clears throat> uh, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, when people see that, see they say, well, Jesus said you'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then there was fire coming down them, so we're going to pray for the baptism of fire. Friends, you're making a big mistake. You're, you're misinterpreting the Bible. Because notice this. When John talked about the baptism of fire in Matthew chapter 3, notice what he said in Matthew 3 and verse 12. Matthew 3 and verse 12. He said, he's going to baptize you with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, he's telling you what baptism of fire is. Verse, verse 11, he talks about he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then in verse 12, he tells you what that baptism is, what that fire is. It's going to be an unquenchable fire that's going to be used to burn up. Now, friends, do you really want a baptism of fire? Baptism of fire is a baptism of destruction. But if you don't understand that, you're going to be sitting there praying, well, Lord, please send me the baptism of fire. Well, friends, I can assure you, if you don't understand the Bible correctly, you're going to get a baptism of destruction. You're going to be destroyed because you are not rightly dividing the word of truth, and you're not understanding what God wants you to understand. And so that baptism of the Holy Spirit was not a baptism of fire. It was like as a fire. It was just something that looked like fire, but it wasn't really fire. So... This idea of not understanding the Bible can lead you to make some disastrous, disastrous pleas or a request that you really don't want, want to happen. Now, let's consider the baptism of the Holy Spirit in more detail just to show you that it's really not a baptism of fire and what it really looks like. Notice this. In Matthew chapter uh, 28 and verse 19, Ask yourself, is this the baptism of fire? Matthew 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. Notice what Jesus said. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, is that the baptism? Uh, uh, is that uh, the baptism? Uh, that, that's, is, is that the baptism of fire that people are claiming? Is that a baptism in water? Is that some other kind of baptism? What, what are the details here? So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is, is this what this is? After all, Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because is this the same thing as what the Bible mentions, let's say in 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13? Because the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit in reference to to a baptism, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Greek or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, is Matthew 28 and verse 19, is that the same as 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13? Is there a, is there a Holy Spirit baptism that's, that's taking place there? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Let's ask some simple questions. Friends, one of the ways that you ought to uh, uh, prepare yourself for studying the Bible is this. Ask questions. Just ask some questions of, 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 uh, 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 of the Bible. In other words, ask yourself some questions and then try to find those answers out. For example, ask this question. Who did the baptizing in Acts chapter 2? Who did the baptizing in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit fell upon these 12 apostles uh, on the day of Pentecost. Who did the baptizing? Well, if you go back and you'll remember, in John 1, verse 35, John 1, verse, I'm sorry, John 1, 33, John the baptizer says, I knew him not, speaking of Christ, he says, I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, uh, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on, now watch it, 
The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So God tells John, you don't recognize Jesus now, but when you see the Holy Spirit descending upon a person and remaining upon that person, that's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, we know who is going to be doing the baptizing of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was administered by Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was given by, by Jesus. So, if I, if I find someone being baptized, and it's not by Jesus, I know right there that's not the Holy Spirit baptism. See how simple that is? So, if Jesus was the administer of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then why would Jesus tell the apostles to go and baptize? Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Why would he go and say, you go and baptize with the Holy Spirit? He wouldn't, friends, because he's the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. See how that works? And so I want you to see how, how simple, if you just uh, use a little, uh, a few questions, use a little reasoning ability when it comes to the Bible, you will see that it's pretty easy to discern what is being spoken of in one particular verse. So Matthew 28, 19 to 20, is not talking about the Holy Spirit baptism because if it was then Jesus would have to be baptizing and not the apostles. If he tells them to go and baptize, then obviously it's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not the same as the baptism that took place in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. That's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Jesus didn't do it. Now, let's look at another case. What happened to Cornelius? What happened with Cornelius? Uh... Let's look at, at Acts chapter 11 and verse 15. Acts chapter 11 and verse 15. Now, this is where Peter, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, verse 40. I got ahead of myself. Acts 10, verse 44. Now, here's Peter. He's at Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a Gentile. And the Bible says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed, watch it, they of the circumcision which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter. There were six of them that came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, no apostle was doing any baptizing here. So Jesus must be the one who was administering this. All right? Now, what does Peter say? When Peter is giving an account of what happens when he gets back to Jerusalem, because he's having to give an account of why he was down at this Gentile's house and why he was going in and, and eating with this Gentile, notice what, what he says. In Acts 11 and verse 15, he's telling what happened. He says, as, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, the Gentiles, as on us at the beginning. Now listen. It fell on us as at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Peter saw what was going on, and he said, you know what? I'm thinking about a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter did not think that what was taking place in Acts chapter 10, when he was at Cornelius' house, he did not think that was the same as in Matthew chapter uh, 28, 19 to 20. He didn't think that was the, the, the baptism of the Great Commission. He said, it reminds me of what happened way back in the beginning. And he said, it reminded me of what John the baptizer said, that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Talking about Jesus. So here's what we know, friends. What we know is what happened at Cornelius' house was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was not the same as what Jesus told his apostles to go and do. In Matthew 28, 19-20, he told them, go into all the world. Go, uh, 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not the same kind of baptism. How do we know? Because the apostles or men could administer one, but only Jesus could administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's an here's a email, here's a letter that, that, that I received, and it talking about this, and it, and it makes this statement about the Holy Spirit. It says, The receiving of the Holy Ghost comes before baptism. Jesus said you must be born again, and that is spiritual baptism. The Holy Spirit is who we are baptized with, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. Now, friends, this is the kind of confusion that we're trying to help answer. Is 1 Corinthians 12, 13 talking about the same kind of baptism that you find in Acts 2? and the same kind of baptism that you find in Acts 10? Now, let's reason together here. Let's, let's think about this. Uh, was the baptism in Acts 2, remember I said let's ask some questions. Ask yourself, was the baptism in Acts 2 and the baptism in Acts 10, was it the same as that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13? Was it the same as the one that put you into Christ? That's really what we're asking. Did the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 1 through 4, when there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like as a fire, was it the same as what took place, or excuse me, was it the same as what Paul's describing in 1 Corinthians 12, 13? Now, the writer of this email is confused. Here's why here's how I know. Because if it was the same, in other words, if the baptisms in 1 Corinthians 12 is the same as the one in, first, in Acts 2 and Acts 10, then here's what we have. Why did Peter say that the one in Acts 10 was like the one at the beginning? Now think about that. The baptism that that uh, happened with Cornelius, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that Peter said reminded him of what John said about Jesus would baptize the Holy Spirit. If that was the, the baptism, if that's the baptism that put you into Christ, then why did Peter not reference a more recent conversion? If that's what was happening Every time someone is put into Christ, if Acts chapter 12, uh, excuse me, if 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is like the sound of a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like as a fire and Holy Spirit coming down on them and people speaking in tongues, if that's the kind of baptism that puts you into Christ, why didn't Peter just make reference to an earlier conversion like in Acts chapter 8? Look, in Acts chapter 10, you have, you have Cornelius. And Peter says, you know what? This reminds me of what happened at the beginning. Now, he didn't say it reminds me of what happened in Acts chapter 8. And Peter was, was around in Acts chapter 8. You know, the Samaritans, when they obeyed, do we need to look at this? In Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, you have Philip going down to Samaria and the Samaritans received the word. The Bible says the Samaritans received the word. Verse 12, notice this. They believed Philip preaching things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, and they were baptized, both men and women. And the Bible says in verse 13, or excuse me, verse 14, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent it to them Peter and John, who when they were come down laid hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. See, the, what happened in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, wasn't anything like what happened in Acts chapter 10. Not what Peter's describing about the Holy Spirit falling on them. He said, no, that's not like Acts chapter 8. We have to go back a little bit further. Well, why don't he go back to Acts chapter 6? In Acts chapter 6, notice this. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, the Bible says, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. When these people were obedient to the faith, when they were baptized, 
was that like the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the rushing sound of a rushing mighty wind and the cloven tongues like as a fire falling on them? Was, was that what it looked like? Well, no, apparently not because Peter didn't even make reference to that. And Peter was there. Peter was in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6. Well, what about Acts chapter 5? Look at this, Acts chapter 5 and verse 14. Notice this. Believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. Now here's more people being added to the Lord. Remember the, the letter writer, our, 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 our question, uh, person the question said, says the Holy Spirit is, is the one that, uh, spirit baptism is the one that puts you in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And that's, that's uh, you've got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost before, before you can ever be put in Christ. Well, there must have been something like that here. But you know what? Peter didn't make reference to that. He didn't make reference to that. He actually went a little bit further back. Now, he could have gone back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. Notice this. How be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were added about 5,000 souls. Now, here's about 5,000 individuals who are being added to the Lord. But Peter doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit falling on them. He doesn't say that what happened at Cornelius reminds me of, oh, this is what happened in Acts chapter 4 when, when uh, the 5,000 people were, were, were uh, added to the Lord. He, does, he doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even say it, it reminds him of the day of Pentecost when he was preaching and 3,000 people were added. Notice this, Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of them just crossed for the mystery of sins as you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What happened at Cornelius' house was even like this. Because Peter says, look, what this reminded me of, what happened at Cornelius' house, reminded me of what happened way back at the beginning. So if this was a, if, if this was a baptism that puts you into Christ, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have been added to Christ between Acts 2, verse 38, and Acts 10, when Cornelius is hearing the gospel. But Peter does not one single, solitary, nary a single time does he say, that reminds me of what happened over there at Samaria. That reminds me of what happened back down there in, in, in Jerusalem. No, he says it reminds me of what happened to us at the beginning. So, see, if, if, Peter, if Peter is talking about a pouring out of the Holy Spirit that happens in every place, why didn't he mention a conversion that was more recent? I'll tell you why. Because the baptism that puts one into the body of Christ is not the baptism of Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, nor the baptism of Acts 10, where Cornelius was. Cornelius was. Okay? So, see how simple that was? You see how simple that was? I'll tell you what, uh, if you could go ahead and put the phone lines up and we'll uh, take, some, take some phone calls if someone's got a question about this. See, friends, we're showing you that it's really simple to understand what baptism is being spoken of here if you just ask a few little questions and think a little bit. Now, last week we reviewed a, a, a booklet that's written by a man named Mr. Hopkins and uh, he was talking about there's, you know, this, this, this spiritual baptism, what puts you into Christ. Well, no doubt about it, you're baptized by one spirit into Christ. But it's not the baptism, it's not the baptism that takes place in Acts 2 with the Holy Spirit being poured out upon them, verses 1 through 4, nor what took place with Cornelius, Acts 10, verse 44 and 45. It's got to be something different. Now, someone might say, well, how is what took place with Cornelius, how is that as the one in Acts 2? Acts 2, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. How's that, how's that the same? How's that as? Notice what Peter says. He says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So he says, now wait a minute. As. 
This happened as. That means exactly like or in the same manner. So whatever happened to Cornelius happened in the exact same manner as the Holy Spirit falling upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, what would that be? How could they be in the like manner? I'll tell you how. Jesus administered these baptisms without the laying on of the apostles' hands. All right? Notice this. Here's what I'm saying this. Look at this. In Acts chapter in Acts chapter 11 verses 15 through 17 Acts chapter 11 verses 15 through 17 Here's what the Bible says And as I begin to speak the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning Then I remembered the word of the Lord how he said John indeed baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost now notice verse 17, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did to us who believed on the Lord Jesus, what was I that I could withstand God? He said, God gave them, God gave them, not me. Now, did Peter ever give a gift to the Holy Spirit? Did Peter, was Peter ever involved in giving gifts to the Holy Spirit? He most certainly was. See, when he says this, this phrase, as God gave them, that's opposed to when Peter gave them. Someone said, well, Peter, Peter didn't give. Oh, yes, he did. Notice this. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Notice this. Then laid they their hands on them. Let's back up one. Verse 16. Peter and John had come from uh, Jerusalem down to Samaria because they've heard the Samaritans had received the word. Correct? And they knew that the Holy Spirit needed to be given to these people because as of yet he was fallen among none of them. Only they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had been baptized. They had been baptized, but they had not received miraculous gifts. You know what that tells me? That tells me that we're talking about two different kind of baptisms here. One was associated with people obeying the gospel, having their sins removed, and another one has to do with receiving a miraculous gift from God. And in this case, it was going to be given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now, wait a minute, Peter. I thought you said what happened to Cornelius was like what happened in Acts 2? The rushing mighty wind sounded rushing right in mighty wind and, and the, the cloven tongues like as a fire? Peter said, well, what happened to Cornelius was like that. It was exactly in the same manner without the laying on the hands. That's how it was the same. Because see, in Acts 8, Peter knew that it was through him laying hands on people that they received these miraculous gifts. It wasn't God giving them directly. It was the apostles coming in and being a, a middleman, if you will, laying hands on these people to give them a gift. Notice this. Again, <clears throat> verse 17. For, for as much then as God, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed in the Lord Jesus. What was I that I could withstand God? What was I that I could withstand God? Notice he says the light gift. That's similar in kind. How was it similar? Speaking in tongues? Did not Cornelius <clears throat> speak in tongues? Yes, he did. Did the, did the, did the, uh, the apostles on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, did they speak in tongues? Yes, they did. How did they receive these? Well, in both cases, Acts 2, 1 through 4, and Acts 10, 44 and 45, the, the, the people who received the Holy Spirit did so without anybody laying hands on them. They came directly from God. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them without anybody laying hands on them. Everybody else, friends, everybody else 
when you hear someone else receiving the Holy Spirit, it always comes through the laying on of the apostles' hands. In every case, except Acts 2, 1 through 4, and Acts 10, 44 and 45. That's how I know that the, the things that happened in Acts 2 and Acts 10 are not the same as happen everywhere else someone ever receives any kind of, of gift from the Spirit. Now, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the light gift, is a supernatural gift. It's the ability to do something that you normally couldn't do, like speak in an unstudied or unknown language. That's what these, these languages were. They were languages that they have never studied before. Notice this, in Acts 10, verse 46, let's look again. Acts, whoops, sorry about that. Acts 10, verse 46. What did Peter and uh, the others hear? They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. What kind of tongues were they speaking with? Well, it was tongues that they hadn't learned. It's not some gibberish. It's not some gibberish. It's something that Peter and the other six that were with him could understand. It was a language. It was a tongue. It was a, 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 a language that, that was spoken. It's just one that they weren't used to speaking, that they had never studied before. Now, how do we know that? Well, we've talked about tongues before on this program. Uh, Let's, let's notice this. In Acts chapter 2, verses 6, uh, verse 6 through 8. Now when this was noised abroad, put this up here. Acts 2 and verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak. He heard them speak in his own language. So they were hearing these languages that they knew these men could not have, have learned. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How do these Galileans, these ignorant and unlearned men, Acts 4 verse 13, how do these ignorant and unlearned men, how do they know these languages? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How did they hear that? Parthenians and Medes, uh, Edomites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in uh, Egypt and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. These were languages, friends. These were languages. But yet, we have people today that say, well, you know, languages are these tongues. They're just, they're just gibberish. You know, they're just angel, angel, angel language or, or whatever it is. Uh, like this lady that called in, and I, I don't know if this is going to play or not now that we've had some our problems. But we had people call in and uh, make these statements about tongues. Give me a little audio here on my video, please. I have a God, and I go to church, uh, church of God, but I'm going to tell you something. You better, if you're a man of God, you, I hate to be standing in your shoes right now, lightning will strike you dead. If you're a man of God, the words are full of them. Well, ma'am, now go ahead and put our phone numbers up, please. Uh, now, now, this lady, is, she's, she's telling me I shouldn't be questioning uh, the Holy Spirit are, are questioning God. And then later on, she's going to go speak in some tongues. Uh, why, why are you saying that? Because the way you said, no, we're mocking God. I'm not mocking God. It's in the Bible. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Ma you, ma you, you ma do. I tell you, praise God. Help me, Jesus, I praise. Ma'am. Lord, just come to me right now. Ma'am, hello. Hello. I I've been giving you Bible. We've actually been going around through 1 Corinthians 14. Now you call up saying I'm, that I'm not a man of God and that I'm, 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 I'm doing all wrong. You have to give one here talking junk about it. Can, can you get, can you give some scripture to show where I'm wrong? 
Can you give some scripture to show where I'm wrong? Uh, I can't take, I, I read my Bible every night. But you, every night but, and every three minute I die. But, but you I got the Holy you Ghost. I was raised, and I didn't in a church since I was four years old. Yeah. I got up and down and down all my life. I got uncles and cousins and everybody. My brothers is preachers. Well, you know but what? I'm telling you something. Ma'am, you, you know what? You're sitting online and saying it's stupid for somebody to be making, uh, speaking in tongues. My mama did it. Everybody in my family does it. And you say you got to have an interpreter. I want you to know some people are in huh? They do have an interpreter in there. Huh? If they was wanted it to be known, they tell it. So mama don't need it. Well, Praise God, I tell you what. God's moving in this okay, world. Okay, okay, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, 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 
in the Holy Spirit are getting some miraculous gift. That had was, to come. He was instructing him to leave the chariot behind. So he was but, basically telling them, "If you come with me to baptize you, do you trust my instincts on finding your no, way back?" No, 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 no. Listen, man. Now, Paul is an apostle. You don't have to trust his instinct. He is confirming everything that he's saying with signs. He can do a miracle. If you don't believe that he is speaking for God, he would do a miracle. If there was any need to confirm the word, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, he said, I'm going to confirm the word. He said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. So anytime he needed to confirm that what he was saying was from God, he had the ability to do a miracle. But so with it Paul, was, Paul, he said, well, either way it goes, if you believe in my belief or not, I guarantee you, you are welcome in the house of Cornelius. No, 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 but no. Cornelius no, believed No, no, ma'am, no. So you, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Laquisha. As long as you made sense to somebody, you had a place to stay. That's Laquisha. what, that's what, that's right, what the rules of Cornelius. All right, Laquisha, here's the thing, though. Rules no, of listen, no, house no, listen, Laquisha, Laquisha. No, you listen, Laquisha, Laquisha. No, listen, all right. All right, she caused in quite a bit. We, we've had some studies with her, and, and but this is what we're just saying. We can't be confusing all these different things. I mean, we're in Acts 19, and then all of a sudden we're over in Acts, Acts, uh, 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 Acts 10, and then we're over here with, in uh, uh, Corinthians and Ephesians. So we have to stay on track here. But what, what we're talking about here is Paul is demonstrating that it is only through the laying of the apostles' hands that they received the Holy Spirit. That's not the same baptism then as what puts you into Christ because these people were, were added into Christ when they were baptized. In Acts chapter 8, they had been baptized and they then had to wait for Peter and John to come down before they received the Holy Spirit. So the point we're making, friends, is this. If getting some miraculous gift is an indication that you're in the body of Christ or an indication that you're saved or if, if your salvation depends upon you getting one of these miraculous gifts, then you even have people in the first century when we know that the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit was available. We have them, some of them waiting around and possibly never even getting a miraculous gift. Let's just look at Acts 8 again. We're, we're running close out of time. But I want you to look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, I want you to notice something. In Acts chapter 8, when Peter and John came down and laid hands on the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Ghost, look at what happens in verse 18. Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, Sirs, uh, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may, he may uh, receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto them, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Simon wanted the gift, and he didn't get it. Now, if his salvation depends upon it, why would Peter and John refuse it? I'm saying, friends, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the same as the baptism that is commanded for people to uh, uh, adhere to, to obey, in order to be saved. That's why Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that miraculous baptism, it's not for today. All the word has been confirmed. We don't need it today. But what we do need is you need to obey the gospel that is preached from this confirmed word. All right? If we can help you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Here's our content information. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week. We'll be back again at 9 o'clock. Until next time, remember ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views.